Climate change will not be stopped by individuals using fewer plastic bags or making more journeys by bike. It will take a concerted and urgent effort by governments, institutions and businesses across the globe. As we prepare to launch our toolkit for businesses to address this defining challenge of our time, the eight schools in the Business Schools for Climate Leadership Coalition held a series of public conversations. We brought together our researchers and teachers and expert practitioners. We asked them to untangle the complexity that has been a barrier to progress for so many organizations and lay bare the issues and approaches that must be tackled if we are to achieve a solution. We know that climate change is not affecting all parts of the world equally, and it is amplifying the geopolitical tensions as Mark Rosenberg described so powerfully. You have climate refugees, people running away from, uh, from problems, from, from, from floods, from different, different problems, from desertification, etc. You have people running away and the emergencies themselves putting enormous load on some governments which cannot handle it. They don't have what uh, the experts call the policy space or enough money, enough institutions to really handle some of this stuff. That is weakening states. It's, it's, it's providing a haven for terrorist groups and non-state actors to kind of step into the void. On the other hand of the scale, just as we know that the impacts of climate change disproportionately affect poorer countries and communities, so policies to address it may also hit poor households harder. Mark Stabil argued for policies that target help for these communities specifically. There are some groups that are, are actually facing a lot more of an uphill battle to change their behavior, either because they don't have the right infrastructure. They might live in small towns where you can't just take a bike and go where you need to go or take the metro. Providing increased support for these populations is another step to making the uh, adaptation and mitigation of, of climate policies to climate change um, less unequal. Conchita Galdan, though, reminded us that business, and particularly profitable business, has a key role in this. We could stop climate change tomorrow by stopping our economies, right? We all had the experience during the pandemic, but we don't want to bear the cost in poverty, unemployment and inequality that that would require. Historically, we have taken for granted the abundance of nature and we have acted in a very linear way. Take, manufacture, use, throw away. Create a mess, clear it up afterwards or not. Emit carbon dioxide, plant a tree to offset it. Daniel Halbert made a strong case for decarbonizing and reducing rather than offsetting. There's geopolitics involved, there's fairness involved, there's ethical questions that leaders need to be able to answer when they provide offset programs. I think that's really key. And, and also because we're just talking about offsetting, it's, it's a huge issue to ensure verifiability. I mean, there are providers that offer, you know, verifiable carbon offsets, internationally established firm, but still, as a consumer or a manager, you need to make sure that the carbon is actually offset. I mean, that's one thing. And another thing is just a question of time horizon. The emissions occur today, and the question is, when are they offset? I mean, tree planting is, is fantastic, but if it takes 25 years to offset the carbon of a flight uh, today, that's just um, a difficult question to answer. And Jennifer Howard Granville warned that even apparently green solutions can have a devastating effect on the natural world. So for example, renewable energy, which, which we see a big push towards, um, does not come for free in terms of its impact on nature. Um, we know that hydroelectric electricity has some very significant impacts on entire ecosystems and watersheds. Um, solar energy is actually seems to be pretty benign in terms of its impact on nature, but you have to have carefully thought out siting and provisioning. Um, wind power has some significant impacts potentially on migratory birds or bats. It's really about thinking through these issues right at the beginning, taking a holistic and circular approach, as Daniel suggested. It's about reducing waste and stuff in the design stage to build better recyclable products. We need to talk about the reverse supply chains, how to get the products back to the firm. 
All of this, of course, is a total reversal of what have seemed so long to be the immutable laws of business. Almost all speakers came to the conclusion that addressing the climate emergency will warrant complete system change. Here is Knut Hannes. We had an equilibrium, we know we have to create a new one, and I think business has to be part of thinking about that one. How do we build the transition to a new equilibrium? How do we make it just and not just kind of a few winners take all of it? And, and how do we kind of make sure that business plays a positive role? Annette Mikes believes that the system is still built around short-term shareholder returns. There is no doubt that there is an institutional environment still out there around companies that makes them feel a lot of pressure for short-term financial performance. So no one should underestimate you know, the logic of or the pressure of the shareholder value imperative that's still out there in force. And so there are still recent surveys from McKinsey showing that 70% of ex executives believe that if there was a conflict, a trade-off between short-term and long-term imperatives, their CEOs would make the trade-off the short-term way. Can new reporting standards make a difference? Lucrezia Reichling has been working with the International Finance Reporting Standards Foundation to develop sustainability reporting. To deal with the, the fact that climate generates a negative externality, clearly there is a big agenda for public policies in terms of defining carbon taxes or, uh, you know, or fees. But uh, we also need technological change uh, and we need to finance that technological change. Uh, and for that, we need public and private effort. And then third, we need a sustainable financial system. So in a system that would allow the private sector to allocate capital appropriately. Achieving this is going to require collaboration, which is of course at the heart of Business School for Climate Leadership Initiative. Some issues are just too great for one sector to solve alone, as Igor Shishlev says here. Climate change is a, clearly a market failure. Uh, the damage caused by emitting greenhouse gases to our society and to nature is not automatically priced by the market. Uh, the polluters do not pay for these costs, right? Now, any environmental economist will tell you that to fix a market failure, one needs a government intervention, and that's where the role of the government comes in. Because with all the best intentions, all the you know, uh, initiatives that are welcome, that businesses are um, taking, it is pretty obvious that the private sector will not solve the problem alone. And within sectors, organizations need to resist the urge to compete on all fronts. Julia Binda believes that this will require a change in the DNA of corporations. It really requires a competition on a completely novel level. And this doesn't mean that we don't need to have any competition, but we don't need to compete on sustainability. We don't need to compete when it's about saving the planet, right? So I think this is something that really needs to change and that is not naturally in our, let's say, corporate DNA. This is something we need to bring into this, in this, into this corporate DNA. Finally, I will leave it to Knut Hannes to summarize the task ahead and what business schools for climate leadership and our business toolkit hope to achieve. Addressing climate is a systems challenge. No one company can solve it alone. Companies can't solve it alone. We need the partnerships and we need the different players to play along. And we need to learn. That's kind of the missing equation of leadership development in some ways, something we have to take into account that we need to teach future leaders not only to run their company, but also to lead, shape and craft systems for finding bigger solutions. But all of this taken together is really business finding a new job to be done and leadership developing to do that job.